Hello everyone and welcome to tutorial number six. Um, Walter here has been feeling a bit unwell so we've decided to play it safe given the uncertain times. Uh, this video is going to be about uh, legato um, bowing, which is to say how to get smoothly joined uh, push bows and pull bows. And this is a question that I'm often asked uh, in lessons. Um, and I think the, uh, the answer is going to be slightly complicated because we need to define exactly what we mean by legato. So let's get started. So what do we mean by legato? Um, I've taught lessons where um, students have been uh, absolutely insistent that uh, there should be no audible join between two uh, bow strokes. And I, I wonder sometimes if that comes from an expectation uh, uh, created by listening to classical, modern, modern classical um, uh, recordings on modern violins um, with bows that are designed in a certain way to be even throughout the, throughout the bow stroke. Um, and for me, legato on the viol is defined by what we, uh, what we want to get out of the viol. And for me, the viol is defined by its articulation, by the ease with which one can get um, a clean and, um, and, and quite present uh, articulation at the beginning uh, of, of a stroke. And in fact, this is what uh, Hubert Leblanc describes in the 1740s in his treatise. Um, uh, he described the sound as uh, tic-tac. Um, uh, this is, this is the, 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 real, the true character of the vial. He also describes the sound as uh, somewhat nasal, like the voice of an ambassador. So I think we need to be a little bit careful about our expectations going into this and, and what it is we, we really want to achieve. Having said that, we can of course uh, achieve a, a, a smooth stroke, at least in contrast to the um, extremely short articulated strokes that we can, we can, we can also play. Um, and the very base of this, the fundamental aspect of this, um, I mentioned in, uh, in, in the previous tutorial video, which is that we should aim not to stop the bow on the string. Now, arguably that's a little, a slightly strange thing to say, um, because especially if you're changing bow on one string, uh, then of course the bow is at some point going to have to stop, um, even if for a tiny, tiny fraction of a second. Um, but there are ways that we can minimize that. Um, and the first aspect of that is making sure that um, we slow the bow down into the bow change. If your bow is moving at speed um, on a push bow, say, and you want to change to a pull bow, if you, if you don't apply the brakes, then the change in the, um, in the bow is going to be really harsh. It's going to be like hitting a brick wall, like this. Um, there's a, there's a, a really clear, <laughs> uh, quite brutal articulation between, between those two bow strokes. If, however, we apply the brakes and slow the bow down, um, we can put the, put the, the bow into reverse uh, and, and transition, change directions much more smoothly. combine this if we want to, to really uh, iron over the change in the bow stroke um, we can combine the, the speed change with a position change and we can move the bow slightly further away from the bridge so that um, the sound is softened if we do the same thing still slowing the bow but near the bridge then the articulation is much more obvious <laughs> need to apply more pressure to the bow uh, in order to, to make the string sound. However, if we move the bow away from the bridge just before the bow change, um, this can help. If we are aiming to change bow strokes across strings, the same thing applies. And again, we have to bear in mind that uh, with changing string, what we want to do is leave the initial string still ringing. We don't want to stop the bow on that string. So again, hearkening back to, I think it was lesson four, um, 
uh, or lesson five on string changing, um, we need to push the hand forward to change the string. Um, and we need to do that while also allowing the bow to continue moving on the initial string. And everything that I talked about in the last video about bow changing is, is still in effect. We want to make sure the bow hits the upper string and then changes direction there, such that the lower string continues to vibrate. However, we also need to make sure that the bow slows down into that transition across the string. But we also need to make sure that we're not um, keeping the same weight, which is to say we can actually lighten um, the, the uh, weight of our hand into the string as we make that transition. I'm not talking about lifting the bow off, I'm simply talking about allowing the bow to fall across the strings. Um, and that lightness um, will allow us to change direction on the next string um, without making too big a, a, of an articulation. So there's a third element to this, um, which actually uh, has um, implications for uh, the last video as well. Um, in the last video, I, I talked about uh, playing parallel with the bridge. Um, and I also talked about allowing the bow to fall across the string during a, a bow change to allow it to, uh, to find its natural position parallel with the bridge. However, um, there is another element to this which is the position of the hand and the extent to which the palm is open and facing the, the sky, the ceiling. Um, so with regard to changing bow initially, um, it's worth noting that when you're at the tip of the bow, in order to get weight into the middle finger, which is um, uh, across the hair up to the first joint of the middle finger, Remember back to the first video, we had this pivot, this, this uh, doorknob motion. Actually, that was the second video, um, whereby we are able to um, apply weight, pressure, tension into the hair. Um, at the tip, um, this is much harder because you're having to translate that weight, the entire length of the bow, to the point of contact with the string. And because of this, we generally tend to have a, a slightly more closed palm which is to say, to use the doorknob analogy, we have turned the doorknob um, about, well, several degrees to your left um, so that we can get that, uh, that weight into the hair. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, at the heel end of the bow, um, this weight is much easier to transmit into the string because the weight of the arm is much more uh, readily available because the point of contact with the string is so close to your arm. So because of that, we don't need to have such a closed palm. Uh, and instead, we can allow the palm to open out, or in other words, we can turn the doorknob the other way. Uh, and this means that we can still get access, we can still get weight into the string, um, but we can control the amount of weight a little bit more easily. If I was to play at the heel with the fully turned doorknob to the left, then I can get an awful lot of weight into the bow, and that's actually too much. Um, if I was to play, that would happen very, very easily if I keep the closed doorknob hand position. With the hand more and the palm more open, much easier control and I can add a little bit more weight if I need to by closing the palm turning the doorknob. So start with an open hand and as I close it the sound gets louder. The added benefit of, um, uh, of this altering in the hand position is that it allows us to bolster the, um, the paintbrush effect with the loose wrist, the flexible wrist. Um, by uh, it additionally buffering the, the change of direction in the bow by um, this opening and closing mechanism. So if I start at the tip where my hand is more closed, the doorknob has been turned to the left, as I go along the bow towards the heel, I open out my hand uh, and then at the heel, 
where my hand, where my fingers reach, uh, open out to, to meet the string, um, I can then gently pull the bow back into the pulpit. I'll show you what I mean. So, tip of the bow, my hand is closed. As I go along the bow, my hand opens out. And then at the tip, I can buffer that the direction change by just gently pulling slightly. And then my hand starts to close up again. So if I do that in one fluid motion, you can hear the, um, the smoothness of the bow change. So again, starting with the hand closed uh, at the tip, finishing with the hand much more open, the palm much more open at the heel, and then transitioning by just allowing the fingers to start to close again into the pull stroke. <laughs> benefit of making sure that your hand is active in this way um, is that we can also use this to make sure that the bow stays parallel to the bridge. Um, that's because if you start out a bow stroke with the hand closed, for example, uh, and you do a push bow, watch what happens to the angle of the bow as I get towards the heel. And again, I, I'm not going to change the position of my hand. My hand is going to remain closed throughout this bow stroke. <laughs> So, yes, my bow has ended up pointing upwards. So we're no longer parallel with the bridge. And the result of this, if I then do a pull stroke, is I lose control of the bow and I lose control of the contact with the string. If, however, I start with a closed hand at the tip, but allow the, uh, the hand to open out as I get towards the heel, I can maintain my parallel position with the bridge. on the top string. Um, the angles involved are more extreme because at the tip, in order to be parallel, my hand has to be quite a long way out um, towards my audience. But the same thing applies. My hand is closed at the tip and open at the heel. And that way I can A, get a nice smooth bow change and also my bow remains parallel with the bridge, which is especially important on the top string, uh, which is much um, easier to make squeak. So it's a whole range of uh, techniques and considerations involved in making sure that your bows, bow strokes are um, smooth and legato. Um, but I would suggest that um, even in consort music where there's a lot of long notes, um, often we don't want to have a completely uh, unarticulated bow stroke. It's always nice to have that little gutty <laughs> Uh, consonant um, to be able to play with and you can use that to a greater or lesser extent of course um, depending on the on the circumstances um, but if you really really want to make a very very smooth bow change um, you have to remember to slow the bow down into the bow chain into the bow change and then uh, allow the hand to open out and close uh, in order to just control the change of direction you can also make sure that your um, if you're changing strings, that you're not stopping the bow um, on the lower string or the upper string um, before transitioning so that you make sure that the resonance continues. Um, and the same applies, by the way, if you're changing bow on one string, you never ever want to stop the bow on the string. You always want to be doing something to buffer, uh, to create a sort of uh, car-like suspension between the, uh, the bow strokes to absorb the shock of the change of direction. So that's the end of this lesson. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to everybody who has supported me thus far. Um, again, there's the usual uh, 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 request to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, you can still leave a donation uh, with the PayPal button in the description box below the video. Um, and I'm very pleased to announce that my uh, Patreon page is is now open. Uh, Patreon allows you to subscribe for a monthly sum and to get different benefits. And uh, with my Patreon account, uh, if you would like to subscribe, you will gain access to um, 
an archive of uh, play along audio files and video files, or otherwise known as music minus one, um, recorded by me. Uh, and you can play along to these videos in, with different combinations of, um, of instrumentation uh, available. So you can uh, take the place of one of the instruments in a console, for example. And if you subscribe, um, you, can, uh, you can also commission new Music Minus One videos from me, uh, and you can also commission new tutorial videos. Um, you can commission one video and one piece per month. Um, thank you very much, and I look forward to building the Patreon page with you all.